Hello and welcome to another Woodworking Wisdom. We're back in the hand tool room to give you a bit of an idea. We're going to look at some more Japanese tools. Last week we covered our Japanese saws, lots of different Japanese hand saws. So if you have questions on those, do you know where we are? You can email us. Colwyn's doing the chat in the computer bits today. So if you've got questions that relate to, we can try and see if we're going to answer those. All right. Nice of you to join us. People joining from different places around the world, quite amazing. Okay, so lots of stuff to look at. Going to cover some more Japanese tools. Um, I've worked here for quite a number of years now, and about the era when I started, we started bringing in a good collection of Japanese tools. We have a guy who works upstairs in the office, still here, had a real good background in sourcing and looking at Japanese tools. A bit of a, a history buff from my point of view. I can go and sit down and say, what about this? How does this do? So quite interesting to go over stuff with him. So my background with doing that here, oh, wow, lots of different stuff that I picked up and had a go with. So therefore, things that I've maybe played with at home when I've started making my own furniture, I find so useful. So that really relates to today. Different Japanese tools that I've used that I kind of go, oh, wow. And it seems a bit of a weird thing, some of the tools that we do that people go, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Is that really going to do that? Is that going to work? We've all got that little bit of, I don't want to pay up with money unless I know it's going to work. So maybe that's part of my idea today. Could we give you a bit of an insight on some of those things that maybe you're unsure about? Because it's not really simple, but mm, problem area for some, okay? The simple Japanese chisel, okay? Beautiful items. Now, Japanese chisels are unlike a Western chisel, depending on what you go and buy, though. So your standard Japanese chisel almost looks a bit more like a carpentry or a butt chisel. So Japanese one over here. Western-style chisel tends to be a bit longer, okay? There's differences on them. They are made totally differently. Um, years ago, if you bought a Western-style chisel, wooden handle, it would have brass ferrule. It might have a cold case steel, all right? Cold cast, which was uh, almost like a wrought iron. Very strong, though and quite desirable to get. Difficult to find now for chisels. Chisels these days tend, tend to be, if you look at a Western chisel, almost will be drop forged, okay? So a casting type operation, or they're machined out of solid. This might be machined out of solid. Um, I've been to places where I've looked at and I think, wow, you machine that from a round bar and you machine all, you put a pin up through into the handle. They're a bit crudely made in ways. But the chisels, they all do the similar job. So what makes a Japanese chisel different to our Western thing? And why would you maybe want a Japanese one over a Western chisel? First of all, with being shorter, it's actually more control. You're a bit nearer the workpiece. Downside to that, the length of overhang of where you can cut into. All right, a few features on these. Now, I'm going to put that one to there. This one, exactly the same type of chisel. The reason I want this... And I'm going to grab my box off the wall because I worked out if I did this a second ago. And Colwyn, you can leave yourself probably on there. I'm going to go to that. I'm going to bring that chisel just up on there. And let's have a look on camera three, I think, Colwyn. I need to grab my triangle from down there. I put that in there. It relieves my hand and allows me to keep talking. Okay. All right. Now, on this chisel, I'm hoping you might be able to see it, especially the guys on your screens at home. They have a laminated blade. That's the first thing that makes this so different. On here on the tip, you get a shiny bit. Yeah, okay, polished it. But there's a dull material on top. So there's two different steels in this blade section. That's quite amazing. So there's a laminated bit in here, another bit of metal on the back. So let's take that back off of there for a second. I'm gonna move our block. Why and what does that do? Okay, in simple, when they're making these, your man in the factory, he has hard steel, high carbon steel. Okay, it will hold its edge very well. And the high carbon steel they seem to be using in Japan is the purest form of high carbon steel you can get anywhere in the world. They really looked into producing something that's going to hold an edge. They then have another steel on the top, which is a wrought iron. Okay, that's a bit more flexible. So you've got a hard steel, which is brittle, and a more flexible steel. And they basically put this in a forge. Now, unlike your Western-style chisel that we kind of said, let's go to Terminate, Cohen. Okay. 
that's machine produced these days, CNC Live or Mail, and they're all about the Japanese man, they're still actually hand making these. I won't say it's all done with this man with a hammer. They will have pneumatic hammers now or motorized hammers or do the heavy beating, but they're still using a forge in exactly the same way as they were maybe 200 years ago. So you put your two bits of metal into your forge, you heat them up, you hammer it, you fuse them together. So you're actually getting that lovely hard metal on the bottom, which is going to do our cutting edge. Softer metal on the top that allows it, if you like, to flex a little bit, give it the strength so it doesn't shatter. That's the first most important thing. I'll take my magnet off. Other weird things on the back here. It has a hollow grind. What does that mean? That means when you come to flatten the back of the chisel, it doesn't take as long. So lots of guys complain about flattening chisel. These are quite quick to do, but you're only flattening the outside edge. And you've got to remember, this steel actually, what they're producing, is harder than I can give you on a Western chisel. So it holds that edge longer, so it'll take a bit longer to sharpen. Other weird things done. Let's go back to camera two, I think, Owen. I'm just going to have different chisel out of the box because, and this is one of the problems I know with these, there is four components in these. So you have a metal ring. I've done it so I can take this one off. That's a strike ring that goes on the top. Our handle, I'm going to tap it. I want to take this chisel apart for you so you can see the four components. Let's move the magazine, but Ooh, let's see if I can get you probably a bit too near. Bring it back a bit. Okay. So if you do a close up, you, get, you can see your four components. So you get your handle. This is a red oak handle. They have a chamfer section on here. They have a tapered type barrel that fits on. Okay, ring that goes on the back actually has a tapered edge that should face downwards. And yes, it's gradually going to wear. This one's done quite a bit of work. It's also dried out a bit that goes on. The chisel has a bolster that fits up inside the handle. That tapered ferrule almost acts a bit like a collet. So the more you use the chisel and it's putting pressure down, that's right, it will lock it in place. I know the label has to go on the back of the chisel. All right. Now, one of the problems I can get occasionally, I get them back. They have a crack line around here because as you use this and they blend this in in the factory where that ferrule is, you can't see it. Tap it together, it won't come apart. The more I actually strike this, and we're going to get to that in a minute, the more it locks it in, okay? So you occasionally might get a seam line around the ferrule that looks like you've broken the chisel. No, that's just those two components. They're made of four components, okay? So our handle, as we said, we get this flared edge now. Camera two, I think, Carwin. Traditional Westerners, we have our chisel. Uh, you can have your Stanley one. You can have a hammer if you like. You get this big mallet. Look how much room this will take. I know you might have quite a bit of room. Japanese don't use big mallets. And I didn't get one out. I should. I forgot to bring mine in, but I've got something of the same size. So a Japanese to strike a chisel, and they do strike it, they have a small hammer. So they've actually got something. There. Now, first of all, it takes up less space. It's easier to control. So the whole idea of the metal ring on here is to stop that flaring. And they actually produce a mushroom shape on the end of the handle up on here that absorbs all that. Okay, works beautifully. Tap that in. All right. So covered there. Next thing, I wonder if I can find one that really shows it. That one's quite good. Smaller chisel. On here. Occasionally, go, and it's difficult to show you. That's why if you look down it, and I don't know if it will show on camera for E. I don't know if it'll go. It's tricky to show you on a camera. This doesn't look straight. In actual fact, it almost looks like you bent the chisel. So up to here, looks straight, and then the handle seems to come back. Well, I've had people say, if it's not straight, it's bent. No, it's not meant to be straight. It's done for a purpose. So actually, it's about giving you clearance to get the chisel further in. So actually, from the chisel blank up to the ferrule, that produces quite a straight line. So you can get that in nicely. If the chisel had made dead straight and didn't have this, this crank bit here, you wouldn't get in far enough. So all those little things make quite a big difference on this, okay? All right, so let's jump that one back in there. Colin, what have you got? Come on then. Um, so, yeah, good question here. This is from Fuller Blarney. He says the hollow on the back of the chisel appears to be close to the working edge. 
how many sharpening cut sharpenings can be done before it reaches the hollow grind? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, I'm gonna go back to our steel limit, but on here, this has picked up bigger chisel. Okay, let's have a look on frame, mate. Let's go, right, okay, you can see it on there. When you sharpen, you'll be sharpening the front edge. I've got to go careful with this because this is like a razor blade at the moment. But turn it over, you have this hollow in here. It comes, as you say, near to the front, right up there. But each time when you sharpen, you take the bear off the back. And I'm going to run down just to here, get to that. You do that. When you stand, you've got to take that bear off. So you take a little bit off the back. And it's designed so the more times you sharpen, you take a little bit off the back. This doesn't get any further up. So that little hollow stays about the same distance back from the edge of your blade. There will also be a flat section either side, which means that if you're using it and you're pairing across anything, you've got something to support you on. That's quite an important part. Some chisels might have three little hollows. This hollow is hand ground in on a rotary wheel. Very cleverly done. All right. So your hollow is there for a purpose. It speeds up the flattening. It allows you to sharpen your chisel quicker. Now, other things which are more difficult to explain, when I said about the high carbon steel, depending on what they use that with, as in a material they can add, so you can have carbon, tungsten, you can get different grades of that steel. So the basic chisels we do, from what I understand, are classed as a white paper chisel, or a white paper steel is the best terminology. Okay, that's what they class it as in Japan. That's a hard wearing, it will hold its edge. If they put more tungsten in, they get what they class as a blue paper steel, which is more of an alloy. So again, harder again, right? So it'll hold its edge well. So we've got two different types of alloys on those chisels, which leads to one problem that I know we got. All right, you've got quite a brittle edge. Um, and I've done quite a bit of sharpening with you guys over, over the last year and a bit. If we do something that I've got here, and I cut these out and they are, okay, you're not to scale, but they are to angle. If we put a standard 25 degree bevel on, which is what they would do in Japan, most of their woods are softer. They still use some oak. This has got a 25 degree bevel, but hollow ground, because for some weird reason over here, we have our tormax, we have our bench grinder, we want to put a, a primary bevel and we do a 25 degree hollow. It actually makes the cutting tip very weak because you've got that curve coming down. If you do a straight bevel, which is how they come, let me line these up. Can you see the blacking behind there? Let's have a look on three a minute. Okay, there. Look at that extra material. By having it flat instead of hollow, you actually gain more material on a 25. That adds more strength to this very point. Okay, so the hollow grind will make it weaker. If we go flat grind off a of water stone, diamond stone, you'll get more edge here, more support, stronger tip. Likewise, now I sharpen all our chisels in the room here to 30. That's a 30 degrees. I've just bent the bit of card over just to make it quick. Even that adds more strength to the tip. And traditional Japanese woodworkers do not sharpen like we do over here with two bevels. So we don't have a hollow grinding behind or a secondary bevel. They would sharpen this totally to 30 degrees up through. Why do I sharpen to a secondary bevel or most of the chisels and hand planes? It makes it quicker to sharpen because I'm not removing so much material. And on something like a hand plane blade, it's quite a thick material. So you can imagine this is quite a lot of material to remove. Yes. But you've got to remember, the softer steel will wear away quicker. That's part of the reason they do it. Makes it quicker to sharpen, easier to sharpen. The harder steel at the bottom, yeah, that'll take a bit of effort. But they sharpen everything to one clean angle all the way up through. 30 degrees, 25, depending on what you're working on. 30 would be better for us over here. And they polish it up. So they don't have that secondary bevel. And that will add more strength to the tip, give you more support in behind it, okay? The chisels are designed to be used, if you like, with a hammer, something that you can tap it, clout it with, quite an important part. Now, it seems quite fanatical, doesn't it, talking about wood chisels like that? But they make them very differently. All right, so we've got a box back out of the way. We've got two different types of chisels, we said. There are other chisels I've got home that we've done over the years. Even got things that are triangular in section, which allow me to get right in the corner of dovetails. 
hold their edge fantastically. Really good. Sharpen wise, I'm not going to do it today. We've done quite a lot of sharpening. Japanese water stones. The Japanese always sharpen on water stones. Quite weird. Um, the, the harder the material, the softer the stone. So we've got different grades. I've got an 800 grit, a 6,000 grit. The higher the number, the finer, the better the polish. And we can get to a mirror polish. When we started selling water stones and I started using them when I was at college, it was fantastic on the finish you could get. There was nothing else on the market at that point that even came near. So as we've gone on, you can obviously get things like combination stones. And it's worth looking into what you buy as a water stone. If you've got O1 and A2 steels, you'll want a specific type of stone. So the best of stone that we've got here, combination of 6,000 and 1,000 grit. So you get the brown is the coarser. White's the finer. That will actually give me a better polish. I can flip it over. It's wider. So if I do my hand plane blades, great for that. Got enough room to get on there, sharpen those. But it'll give me a high polish, but it's also suited for those harder metals. So it will cut them quicker, allow you to sharpen things up quicker. So water stones are quite an important part of the Japanese thing. They need to be kept flat. So ideally, you want to rub two stones under water is better bucket water under a running tap is great because actually it flushes that way you rub two sort of grades together you can flatten them off you do need to keep them flat especially if you're doing the back of your chisel if you've got a stone with a curve in it down the length and you do the back of the chisel you're not going to produce a flat face so quite important to keep it flat a little stone i've got here and this is the ice brand that we do all right ice bear kit six thousand good come with a little white stone and i get people say What's that do? That's a Niagara stone. The only idea with this is you can produce a slurry on this when it's wet. I'm down it. That slurry will give you a, a finer polish yet again. So it takes it higher again. So you get that mirror polish. So quite an important little stone, that one. Just going to put those out of the way. Colwyn, what have you got? So Marie is asking, um, can you tell us how long to soak water stones prior to sharpening? Do they soak? What? How how? Prior to sharp, sorry, prior to sharpening, how long should you soak a water stone? Yeah, depends a little bit on the brand, okay? But logically, I would put them in there for five minutes, all right? So it's submerged. And, you know, to give you an idea, depending on where you are and where you have your workshop, in here, because I never quite know what I'm going to have to do, and under the bench, I have my water stones. So the ones I've just shown you, I took out last week just to get them dry to make sure I can put them on the bench nicely. These soak in water, but in here, I don't get the risk of it freezing. Okay. If they freeze, you can crack the water stone. And that applies to things like your Tormek as well. So it's worth keeping them wet if you can. What to store them in? Best thing is those clip on lunch boxes that you get these days with the clip on lids fantastic to do you can leave some water in there you can soak them you can get them out as you need them if you want to dry them out put them in five minutes before you're going to use them that'll work you'll see them almost bubble get little air bubbles come out the stone it'll soak the water in quite quickly it'll be ready to use doesn't take long to soak them spray them with a spray bottle to keep them damp flush away that material you'll notice it it's all right remember as with Japanese saws, they cut on the pull stroke, your pressure pulling back towards you, not pushing into it, you'll cut the stone. They are softer. So it's just really a case of soak them, let them get damp. You'll soon know, okay? Sort of five minutes is a good time limit, okay? People say, oh, you should, you know, why, you know, you should leave it an hour. No, no, five minutes will do you fine. If you can, you're regularly using your workshop, leave them in a trough. Clean it out once in a while, keep it clean, be great, okay? Okay, we're going to do something I didn't do last week. We're going to do a saw, and we looked at all the other saws. Now, last week, and I forgot about this one, coping saw. I don't know, maybe this isn't a, a traditional Japanese tool. Um, now, this is a freeway coping saw. So I'm just getting a bit of wood we can put in the vice. Okay, on this, we can... <laughs> Still cutting towards me. A bit like a normal coping saw, but a bit like Ben's 3D blades, I can cut in any direction. So I come across, I'm coming back up now, go right a bit more up. 
can go right a bit more. Let's come back out. So I don't even have to move the handle. That's fantastic. Okay. And it's almost like the spiral blades that you get for your fret saw. But absolutely fantastic. So I haven't got any of this thing of having to tilt this or move it or I can work in any direction. Wow. So I love that, okay? Really good for that. Um, other thing people are going to say, maybe, let's just see if I can say, can you get a free cone on the, okay. On the end of the blade, it does have specific blades you have to have because they have like a, an O-shaped section that clips in both ends. So it has got a specific type of blade that go in them. Yes, you can obviously undo and tension the blade. You don't have, or you do, we can tilt that round, we can move it around if you need to, but you can work in a direction. Wow. Okay. So I love that blade. That's that's quite fantastic. Right. Change the bits of wood. Got a nice piece of beach. Right. Let's have this side. Doesn't it look horrible? So I'm going to put this in here. How many of you play with these Japanese saw files? And I can remember looking at these and going, yeah, right. So what are these? The best way I can describe this, we have three cones, look. Got like a honeycomb shape. This has got this edge, coarser teeth, finer teeth underneath. In reality, this looks like a load of bandsaw blade bits joined together. That's about as simple as I can phrase it for you, but that's almost what it looks like. Everything is welded. There's a couple of uh, pins that come through to give it the strength structure. It's a bit flexible near the handle, but you've got lots of teeth. I remember looking at these and going, I don't know. Other one, got handle. So you've got something to grip, handle back here. You've got something you can push on. Both work. What do they do? Okay, so... This is coarse side. I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to go oh, this one. So I'm just going to swap this around. What do I want this one? I've got the handles to hold on to. So I can turn it around at the moment. We're going coarse. If I get it back in the right place. There. Clip it back in. Tension it back up. Got that handle. Now, this, unlike most Japanese saws, cuts pushing away. Now, we could do this at hand plane. I'm trying to be really quick and brutal to give you an idea of what this will do. So we've gone from something, okay, we've cleaned up quite quick. You can see what we've got. And we're actually cutting. We're producing a shaving. We're not producing dust. That's got, I don't know if it'll really show, a little bit of texture. That's quite big teeth on there. Turn it to there. This one's lovely because I like the said I love the handle on this that I can get into there, clip it in, turn it back on. Much finer teeth on the opposite side. Okay. Again, I doubt the camera will really get into that. Okay, if you can see the teeth on the bottom where my fingers are, they're bigger. Much finer up on here. So again, we can get into there. And I know this is one of these things that I often looked at in the shop and went, does it really work? Looks a little bit flimsy. Okay, we covered all our board. I'm trying to figure out earlier a way of showing you how this gives you a finish. Okay, this is a 0.1 feeler gauge. Okay. If I go down the bit we haven't touched... You can see it digs in, okay? If I come up to here, that's dead smooth. Really good. That's quite amazing. For something that actually looks quite brutal to use, it will give me clean finish straight off. Nice clean grain. I think you can probably see, okay? So really impressed with those. And I can remember the first time I ever used one and going, oh, wow. And I know with definitely working in the shops, people go, yeah, but what does it do? What do you want it to do? What do you want it to remove? So one of the other things I like about it, in fact, it's got square sides. I can get right into the joint here. 
clean that up to a platform. I can use it on edge. So I can square up a shoulder, relieve a tenon a little bit more. Here are those weird and wonderful little things, but it will give us a good finish. You can go across the surface. Fantastic. You can obviously, now I've done, if you think something flat, and it'll lead nicely to the other bit. Okay. Uh, rough shape, really quick. Bang that out nicely. How about we clean it up? Turn it over. Again, we're getting something more as a shading. We're not getting dust, but we're actually getting something that will clean in a bit. Quick and easy to do. Amazing at shaping, quick removal, okay? So, from there, something we have played with before, and we have a whole load of, okay? So, I think we'll go to Tulip Cohen, okay? On there, mate, good, All right? So, Japanese carve as far as there's round, half round, square, flat, we do different grades. And again, this is one of these products that, over the years, when we start bring it in, I can remember going, it's a what? Japanese carver's file. So this has an etch tooth effect. So it actually almost looks like a mill cat coming across it. I think you can probably see it. Okay. And they have teeth both sides. They cut pushing wood. All right, so this is fine one. All right, I can get into there. Again, I can use it. Do our shaping. Blend things together. <laughs> really nice to use. Um, they give me a finish unlike a rasp. So these will give me a really clean, easy to work finish. Just try to go out what we've got, blend that right in. And again, it'd be lovely to be able to show you. <laughs> I could almost sand and polish now. I could put your, your wax on there. Look really good. Okay. So straight off the tool, I can get to something that's almost a sanded finish without having to go. Okay. But maybe that leads to our next thing. And I'm trying to be quick with these. I know we got quite. Right? So we did our carver's file. Let's lose our bit of beach down the end. One more. There, two, one in a packet, then under there. Look. Okay, where are we up in there? So these are, I'll come back, sanding plates. Okay, um, I'm old enough to remember Stambink used to do a plastic sanding plate, quite flexible, quite nice to use. So the plastic ones had almost lots of little dots. And you could sand with them. And then they vanished off the face of the earth. Couldn't find them anywhere. So we got these in a few years ago. So these are an NT sanding plate. I don't know what the NT stands for. Probably something to do with the company. They have handle backer. So each of those will have a bit more of a look in the mix. You can hold different directions. Underneath, and it's difficult to see. I think there's a nice picture on the website. It's almost got lots of little dots. So it's a and it looks like a plastic plate. It's not plastic. Actually, and underneath here, it is metal. Okay. Have an alloy handle. Now, I think, let's have a quick look if I can see if I can find it. I'll have a magnet again in a minute. It's attached to something else now. Okay. But these are metal. And then they have a plastic coating. All right. Really weird. So they don't rust. But fantastic to sound with. And again, you can have different grades. Now, one of the things I loved about using these... And we've been doing a couple of things in here, project stuff. So I've got my box. Okay. Need to get it finished. I've got an overlap joint. Comes out each of the end. Tricky to clean up nicely. Hem plane's not good. This, I can just work there. So I can work down it. And you almost think you're not doing anything. I'm getting a red on here. That's a good sign. So it's not in there. The nice thing, it's easy to hold. Good to grip. Cuts effectively, little resistance. Going to last longer than a brazier paper. That's a downside. We don't sell you as much. 
but okay so you're not going to wear it out like you do a brazier or you don't throw it away great for and i found them fantastic for leveling this end in where i've got the end grain and the side grain my halving joint if i try and go in with a block plane oh, i'm gonna tear the corner i've got to change direction this wow right into there other things i loved about this i can get and i'm gonna swap it now to the small one right into the corner so I've got a little bit of glue in there, get right down to that corner. I can work along this edge because the plate finishes square to the holder. There. I said you get different grades. You can undo the screw, take it off, swap it over. So you can get coarse, medium, fine. In fact, on these, there's different shape handles. Fantastic. All right, nice and clean. Get into there. All right, so my box, let's put that back over. So, oh, sanding plates. And I said one of those weird things again, that when you looked in the shop, and I know, you know, from our point of view, we both worked in the shop, on the shop floor, the customers come and go, yeah, but does it work? And I love being able to actually get stuff out and go, let's have a go with this. And then draw attention to it. Part of the idea of this video is that maybe I can show you a few things that you might have done, I'm thinking about, but I don't know. So, got our sanding plates, all right? Okay, one of, I'm clearing the mess up a little bit now, my favourite tools. Guys that have been watching me enough, well, now I play with this one a lot. Colin, Colin, what have you got? Yeah, just before we move on, um, Lawrence is asking, how do you clean those sand, uh, those sanders? I'd go with a brass bristle brush, right? Almost like a suede brush is the best thing. But I also know that if you take them off and undo the screw, you can flex them a little bit. You could even run them under water. So we even, you know, those little things. Um, I know, and it's changing slightly, my carbide birds at home, rotary ones, coarse ones, I clear out with a wire brush. So with these, you could go with a brass brush, okay? And that's an important word, brass brush. So a whatever class is a suede brush would be your best one, okay? But you can wet them, okay? Other major thing is a sensible thing, how you store them. Try not to bang them together so you prolong the life of everything. They come in a nice little plastic box. And that sounds weird, doesn't it? But you could even, and that's not the one for that one, all right? Cohen's pulling funny face. It looks a big box of this, okay? But it's the best thing you could probably, if you're going to leave them in your workshop, if you can, put them in there. So it, it, it packs it away. The other nice thing is, do you remember where it is? Instead of going, where did I leave it? Okay? So really good for those. I love using those for different tasks. And actually, the more I play with them, the more I go, Right, I can get right into, right? even as I said to you, things like your tannins and stuff, you can get into that recess. Not difficult. If you think about trying to hold a cork sanding block to do where we are now, you've got to grip the top of it, trying to get into that corner. You might not want to sand the side face, just the bottom. Easy to do. Okay. And you might want to take a little bit off. And it also gives you a finished surface, something clean that you can put your polish straight on top of. Okay. So great to use. All right, now what I'm just saying, next one. Japanese marking knives, okay? So if you've been following where I've done some of the joints, the mortise and tannins, the halving joints, to mark out my joints, most times I will use Japanese marking knife. I like the structure of how I can hold it. It has nice sharp edge. The features that we have in the Japanese chisel appear in this, have hollow back. I don't know if they have a laminated blade. Weird thing, they're definitely not, is straight. Okay, do if that shows. You can hear it. Okay, so they are bent slightly. That's about giving you clearance for when you hold it to do the cut. They're not meant to be straight. That's an important word to get over. So if we go with something as a square, as I hold it, it brings my hand that side of the square so I can line things up just a little bit nicer. Got a bit of an angle so I can bring my thumb over the top of the square, if you like, drag my hand across. Sharpen to one point in this one. You can have right and left hand one, which comes up to a dead point in the center. Um, people say, why do you not use the point one? Find it harder to sharpen, okay? I'm naturally, I suppose, right-handed. There are times when I wouldn't actually have to try and do a joint the opposite side, but it's rare. Okay, so I tend to go with a right handed one, but there is point one which you can come from there. It's a bit steeper angle, left leg to chip it. 
you need to be careful that you don't drop these too much. Sharpen wise, water stone exactly the same. I would set an angle, push down it. Up there, and down. Okay, so I don't try and machine sharpen this. I will actually up there, polish it. The top point where it comes back there, I can even do a little bit there, lift it up, but try not to drop it on the floor. Okay. We can obviously do a little bit on the back, get it really sharp. And you can get these like a razor blade. They are nice and sharp. They have a nice stiffness to them to make it easy to use. Okay. Some of my stuff, if I do things like hand cut dovetails, I'll go back to using a scalpel, which I need the thinness to get in there for my heavy duty marking. I'll get away with that. Next thing leads to squares. Japanese have their own sort of squares. Okay. One. So we do three or four of these different sizes. Again, really, really useful. Um, and you get people going, what's different about that and that? So an English square over this. This has a lip. I think they're a stainless steel material, so they shouldn't corrode. I've never seen these rusted. They always look like this, a few fingertip marks. They have a lip that I can sit on the side. That's nice that I've got something to pull back on. That's that side. Yeah, you can do that with a square. I've got more material to hold here, so actually it draws my thumb away from the cut point as if I'm using a normal square and I'm clamping on. My fingertip gets a little bit near to where the knife's going to be, and occasionally I put a little flat spot. It's not the best thing to do. This being wider, I've got more room to get on. Easy to do. This one also has things, obviously you have 45, new angle, works right or left hand because it's, it's over. You have... Angles inside, 45 again, and they come right down to where the bottom bit is, that lip. One complaint I have seen that we've got, the scale, and it is in metric, down on here, starts at the bottom, down here. That's great, actually, for a couple of things. If you're going to put it on things like a saw table or saw bench, or you want to set a height for a drill bit coming down, you've got your height. But I've used it on a table saw, because I can put it next to my blade and set the blade height I want. Great for that. If I want to do a 45 degree angle on my saw table, I can use that to give me accurate setup. All right, so those little things really appeal to me. I love the fact that it's wider, easier to use. Get in there, put it across, okay? Nice scale, I've got a scale on the other side, we can do a mitre. Carwin. Cliff is asking, um, why do the marking knives not have a point? Tech support said they don't have a point. And why do they have a point, so? Why do they not have a point? In what way do you mean a point? So double bevel? Oh, okay. So on this design, okay. So this is me asking really questions on the question. This is good. Okay. They have a single bevel, which is obviously about giving it structural strength. Okay. So it comes up right to a point at the tip, right at the top here. All right. Ooh, that's close. Okay. So you get a nice long edge on there. So it comes, this is actually right up to a point here, but it's only got one bevel. The back is dead flush, which means that anything I want to rest it on, if I line it up square, I get a nice 90 degree knife, or knife line this way. Okay, if you have something like a standing knife blade, which has a bevel both sides, and you draw your line, you actually make a V. This gives me a steep shoulder. That side, I'd work my chisel in from here when we did the joints. So if I was making that joint, I'd come there and then come in from the chisel edge. That gave me a nice square shoulder point. So that single bevel can be great for that. The double knife I said about with the point coming up to the tip, you can obviously work either side and you can use that shorter tip. I find it got to be higher because where that tip is. Got to come across. I can obviously work right or left hand. I'd need to flip my square over. Nine times out of ten, you can turn the wood round. So that can make life easier. I'm still working right-handed. So yeah, what feels more natural. So I'm hoping I've answered that in the right context. If not, email us again. Let us know. Tell me what you think. Okay. But marking knives, I love for the weight. They're not overly heavy. They're not big and bulky. They allow me to hold it. Get my accuracy up there. Square, like I said, number of different uses for these. 
I love the 45 aspect, and I know it's an accurate 45. The other one I've got is really about doing your mitres and your 45. Okay. Again, stainless steel type body, you have our shape. Now, unusual with this, most 45 squares you get that way. Okay. You never get the hollow in the other. So actually, you've got something you can mark either side and check an angle with. That's unusual. All right. So there are some unique features in those that you can actually use that for and get over certain problems where you can't mark the mitre where you want to do it easily. So same sort of thing. You've got that support. Got some of the grip. You've got that lip that hooks on like a normal square, double-sided. right? And it is just, in reality, a square. Next thing. And this is staring the marking, but sliding bevel, okay? Um, these, and I think Cohen can vouch for, when we both started here, we sold these at this point. This was the only sliding bevel at that point that had something as a twist lock on the end, no screwdriver. And I can remember thinking, wow. Wow. Um, in the workshop's not so bad. Maybe you've got it to hand. You've got to, but when you're up a ladder or something, you're trying to mark an angle and you've got to find the screwdriver. You've left it down on the floor. Nothing more sickening. So it's great. And it looks just like a normal sliding bevel. But like I said, this was the first one that had that tension lock. So it gave me something very different. And I love the fact, again, you've got, you know, it's anodized. It won't rust. Stainless steel blade. We can tilt anywhere. We can set your angle. We can lock it off. Right, ah, easy to do. And that's quite a unique thing, something that you can work with easily. And maybe I like it because I know it's the original one. There are lots of copies of this now, sadly. If they're made as well, I don't know. The Japanese tend to have quite a uh, high spec of what they want to make, quality-wise. Comes together nicely. And like I say, it doesn't look like anything different than a sliding bevel, but something a little bit odd. All right? So marking tools really come into that. Uh -oh, Cohen's back with his question. So I've a, okay, back to the knife one. Hi, oh, yes, we're going to go back to the knife just okay. briefly. Uh, Maria's asking, is there any advantage to a marking knife over a 0.3 mechanical pencil? Okay. Um, depends on what you want to do with your marking knife, okay? And that's, that's a bad way of phrasing it, isn't it? Let me just do to the... My still and picture shut just about good. Okay. No, I don't know if you can remember when we did that there. Now I can mark out with a knife. Okay. Pencil. I can mark a pencil line. Now I know there are some pencil markers out there, they're a little bit different. You can score now. My Japanese marking knife line, I've really got a score line in. Okay. So if I go in with a chisel. And I work on one side. I can create a groove. I could deepen it again. I can come back in with my knife. Create a shoulder line again. So that's right up against where we are. Sitting up square again. Pull across. I can go back in. I'll chisel. Put the glasses on there. I need those on there. Let's just clean out the bottom of that. So, again, my shoulder of my marking knife, I can come right up against that shoulder point we just cut. Get it flat. Uh, I'm going to go that minute. A bit longer. To there. Bring that in. Drag down. Okay. Yeah, okay. And if I was doing something like a halving joint, I can now bring that saw right up against that shoulder line we've just produced. Drops into that groove. I don't even have to concentrate to that now. I can cut that line, okay? So it gives me the accuracy of getting right up against there. So my marking knife will work. There are times when I will mark out a pencil or, okay, or a scalpel for certain jobs. But this gives me a nice, if you like, pressure point to push something firm enough but not too big and bulky, okay? And gives me a square shoulder one point. That's... Probably my major thing, definitely. Cohen? Yeah, Jenny's asking, so does that make the one-sided blade more difficult for left-handers, or is there a left-hander? No, you, you just turn that way. 
Okay. Um, if you were going to go left-handed, you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. It, it, come on. Do, does left-handed people make it more difficult to do wood life? Okay. All right. So okay. So you can get, and it's something actually I inquired about a while back. It's actually having been through, and I mean the magazine picture I showed you earlier. When I started here, oh, let's go back. This is summer of 99, okay? So we used to do this as an in-house magazine, summer of 99, okay? I think there might be a picture of Cohen in here, this, this, okay? Um, so when we used to do that, we used to sell a left-handed marking knife. And I'm pushing at the moment to kind of say, could we do one size, say the 12 or the 15 mil, as a left-handed knife? If you were left-handed and you wanted something, I would go with a 0.1 at the moment, okay? Or have a look and see if you can find a left hand. But it can be nice to have. I don't like that. I'm using it right handed. Now, the, with how I hold it here, I can get into there. I can sight down through. It's in love, my body. Easy to work to. Gives me something there nicely that I can work. Okay. And I love the fact that chips in line when dragged down. And it's totally flat on the back. That little bit of dog leg shake maybe gives me that clearance to line things up. It's all ergonomic about how you're holding it. The Japanese are very good at doing things like that. All right. I mean, I can remember actually having to go and chat with a guy upstairs, Tone, about the fact of have people comment they're not straight. You said they're not meant to be straight. They're meant to have a little bit of, because how you're holding it, it's ergonomic for how your body works, for your arm and everything, that position. So, yes, your left hand thing, if you, if you can, Maybe the point one would be better. Okay, they're tricky to try and regrind to get a left-handed yourself, but it is something I will mention again upstairs and kind of say, could we have a left-handed one, one size? Does it, you know, could it not be possible? All right, okay. So I love the fact of using the marking knife. Definitely, it depends now, Maria. Going back to your question, there, there's certain things where I will mark out with a pencil first measure things up, then I'll start marking out with my knife. I might go with a marking gauge to produce a cross it, cross it. But even that little wheel of a marking knife, I can then go back in and deepen things with my marking knife that I've got there. So the, if I use the marking gauge, I can create a line, pick that back up with the marking knife, deepen it. Get a bit more of a score line because that gives me a nice, easy entry to get that saw into and a square shoulder to work to. I haven't got to square those up after. So that makes a lot of difference. Okay, down to there. Yeah, just turn around to those. Did Japanese sword. Right, okay, next thing. And this is like ranting, raving about camellia roll. Okay, it's one of these weird, unusual things that, again, we've used over the years. We do applicator. Fantastic to stop things going rusty. Japanese chisels might be nice material. They are high carbon steel. If you get them wet, they will still rust. So it can be worth. They do a blackened effect on the top, polished underneath, a wipe over, let it dry to a film. It will draw into the metal structure a little bit. It will stop things corroding. Fantastic. I mean, again, it's one of these products that we've sold over 20 years. We're still selling it now. It must work. We sell lots of this. Why? It works. It's functional. It stops things corroding. All right. My laid bed at home, I'll put camellia oil on. I've seen things over the years where we've, you know, got lots of that. It can be great for that. My hand tools, fantastic. I've just been given a load of wood turning tools that I'm cleaning up that got a lot of rust in. The next stage, cleaned off most of the rust, buffing it out using uh, polishing mops and a Webrex type wheel. Get rid of that, then build it from there, then go with the camellia roll. So it does actually work nicely for that sort of task. Definitely brings things up. Okay. Now, last little set of tools. At the moment, we've looked mainly at woodwork tools. Um, <laughs> and we, I have these at home. And can, you've got to be a little bit careful. First of all, we can't ship these to Malta. So, Lawrence, I don't think you can have these out there. You've got to be over 18 to do these. Now, I have quite a big garden. Colwyn does quite a bit of gardening. Um, we sell these sort of things. I've got one of these at home. I've got an older one. It's black. And it came in a blackened effect. They've updated this slightly. It has a measurement scale. All right. it has a cut edge, which is serrated, a cutting edge on the here. This is a garden trowel. And I will tell you, as a garden trowel, I've never managed to bend it, break it, or make it go rusty. 
Okay, so you can get it in. Now in Japan, this is classed as a hori hori, which is dig dig. Okay, it looks like it does look like a knife. I will say yes, we kind of both sort of okay, but really good for digging and using as a trail. You can obviously cut your plants in half if you're separating things out. You can use a weeder, but it's quite accurate. So quite an unusual thing comes in nice laborate case, which is important because you can store it and again stops you. Okay. Don't get down the pub on a Friday night with this, though, all right? So that one, really useful. We then do this one in here, and I had to borrow these from the warehouse, so I've got to go back. I've got to try and keep them clean. This is a root cutter. And again, these are traditional Japanese tools, so you can actually put this in, cut your root. It's actually got a saw blade edge down through here. Type is on the other side. From what I know, these are all stainless steel. Wooden handle, nice and easy to grip, not too long. Put it in there. Great for that sort of task, okay? And it's almost going back to those Japanese saws we looked at last week. I just put it's something unusual. I know I do use them at home. There's one thing we don't use or that I haven't got that I use. Last one, this is your trimmer for your weeding, okay? Nice thing this, and it looks like a garden size, smaller version. Again, it's got saw blade tip that comes up, it's tapered, okay? Heat treated. The back of it actually curves away, but you can get in behind, cut things. So it actually allows you to get accuracy, cut the weed off, okay? You can trim with it on your branches. So really useful for those tasks. And something, again, in our garden where I kind of go get, and it's unusual to find a garden centre over here. But fantastic. One of those unusual tools that we do sell. Um, I've got a traditional Japanese weeding tool, which actually means you can hook in behind the plant you want to cut, pull it towards you. It's all about pull, even with the garden tools there. Cut pulling back towards you, okay? So, some Japanese garden tools. Most of you, you know, summer's coming. You're going to do some gardening. Fantastic things to have. Make life easier. Quite unique, some of the things we've looked at this afternoon. I hope, you know, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's, it's a bit of a, try and think of different things that I can show you. And someone said, you've got a load of Japanese tools you use. I went, yeah. Could you try and explain them? What do you mean? It's, it's a file, isn't it? No, if you don't have... And like I said, my favourite thing, definitely, the Japanese saw file. I'd never actually, when I first picked one up, and come remember going, hmm, I don't know, that's never going to work, is it? Fantastic. Really effective doing what it does. Remove material quick, fast, it doesn't clog, gives a good finish. All right? So hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, we will be back again Tuesday. Can't remember what we're doing Tuesday, Cohen. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, Ben, can you remember? Ben got? I've got penguins. Penguins, okay. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what Ben's got. Um, I've got a black and gold bowl, and then I can't remember what Ben's doing, but we will be back here next week. All right. So, hope you've enjoyed it. Have a good weekend. We'll see you soon. Bye then. <laughs>